This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, executive editor of the Breakthroughs newsletter. A good night's sleep is something many long for but struggle to get. Dr. Phyllis Z has dedicated her career as a physician scientist to understanding circadian rhythms and improving sleep. She's the director of the Center for Circadian and Sleep Medicine here at Feinberg and a physician at Northwestern Medicine. She's also part of a Northwestern team that's developed a new blood test to help doctors identify circadian rhythm disruptions in patients. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Erin. So more on that new blood test in a moment. But first, I want to talk about sleep. So it's a fact about 70 million Americans suffer from sleep problems. What are the most common? Well, one of the most common reasons why Americans are not getting enough sleep is because they're not prioritizing sleep. It is, in some ways, part of a very busy lifestyle, and everything else becomes more important. And so sleep deprivation is pervasive, and it's really estimated that most Americans are not getting enough sleep. On the other hand, there are many sleep disorders that also rob people of a good night's sleep, and for that matter, of being able to function well during the day. So the most common ones are like sleep apnea, which is pretty common, and it it does increase with age. Many of these sleep disorders, insomnia is probably the most common sleep disorder. So these are patients who have difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or just poor quality of sleep. And then there's restless leg syndrome. And one of the sleep disorders that physicians often don't think about, or patients for that matter, is circadian rhythm, sleep-wake disorders, because they present like somebody who may have insomnia or somebody who may have what we call hypersomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness, but it's actually due to an alteration or pathology in the circadian clock system. The circadian clock system, how do you explain that to patients and people that come to you to be a part of your studies? So timing is really crucial. I think timing is actually everything, right? So when you think about the circadian system, the word circadia means about 24 hours, about a day. So these are endogenous or what we call intrinsic rhythms that kind of keep a time of approximately 24 hours. They're not driven by like dark cycles. They're not external. And what we have found, and I think this is the coolest part of it all, is that these rhythms are generated at a molecular level. So genetics really regulate these circadian rhythms, and they exist. This clock system exists in every single cell of your body. You've actually found certain genes that are connected to the circadian clock. Tell me about that. So the circadian clock system in in cells and all tissues are regulated by this core clock genetic mechanism. So very simply, there are these genes. uh, Let's call one of them, let's call it period gene. Uh, The other will be clock gene. But there's more than 10 of these genes. And they reside in the nucleus. And what they do is how much of the protein that they're producing, how quickly these proteins get degraded in a cytoplasm, they determine whether you're going to be an owl or a lark. So if you're an owl, it's because your clock genetic system is going, taking a little slower than normal and or, or than 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 the 24-hour cycle. If you're a lark, it's probably going a little faster. That's why larks wake up early because they finish that circadian cycle, that molecular circadian cycle, a little faster than the rotation of the Earth on its axis and the sun. In the last decade, there's been some really fundamental findings in this field that have allowed others to see that this is beyond sleep, that um, the circadian clock really controls almost the entire health of the human body. Yes, indeed. The the circadian clock system uh, exists in every cell, in every tissue uh, of your body. And I think this is this fundamental discovery from basic science that has really changed the way we think about the role of sleep in circadian rhythms in health. So that if you alter circadian rhythms or there's pathology of that system and or you're not getting enough sleep, it's not just going to affect your performance 
or how you feel, but indeed is going to affect broadly all tissues, the health, uh, overall health, whether it's metabolic health, whether it's mental health, or for that matter, just you know, your ability, your, your memory, your memory is affected. Your ability to learn is affected. So it's really the implications for health are quite broad. Just last year, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded for the regulation of the circadian clock gene. This is gone to a worldwide audience now. People, and especially physicians, are starting to understand circadian clock is important. This is a major recognition for the field, uh, getting the Nobel Prize for discovery of the genetic machinery, you know, of uh, how circadian rhythms are generated. So why would that be? Because implications of that finding that it exists in all cells has this broad implications for health and opens up an entire field, I think, of medicine, which I will call circadian medicine, which is really beyond sleep. It is about how circadian timing, and not just timing, these circadian clock genes are regulating immune function. They're regulating, they're integrally involved in bioenergetics, metabolism. So really, the circadian medicine is about how can we use this timing information to increase precision of treatments, accuracy of treatments, but also how do we personalize that? I can't think of anything that is more applicable to personalized medicine than timing. Can you tell me a little bit about your latest publication that describes a test called Time Signature? What is this test and what can it tell us about our circadian rhythms and internal clocks? I think Time Signature, uh, which is a blood test, is really a major breakthrough for my field. And perhaps, uh, really, I think the first type of blood test that will have implications for how we treat and identify patients with sleep and circadian disorders. So what the, the concept here is that the, these, these clock genes or just are regulating timing in all tissues of our body whether it's in the pancreas, whether it's in your gut or lung and so forth. So then how do we tell internal timing versus external timing? So classically, it's been really tough as a physician for me to say, Aaron, do you have a circadian misalignment? How do I know that? How I know that is by taking blood samples uh, every half an hour, every hour across 24 hours. This is what we do at Northwestern. We do great research in this area. And we plot out a, a, a profile and we say, aha, your melatonin rhythm is going up, at, let's say, at 9 p.m. So that's what we call a phase marker. But that's not practical. We can't right. possibly every do that for a patient. Imagine that. So, so now this, this time signature test allows us to take a blood sample at any time of the day, and preferably, especially in in this particular study, if you take two blood samples uh, about eight hours apart, we can now predict your molecular and your circadian timing within 1.5 hours. So I can tell you what time of the day that blood test was taken without knowing what time it was. You said this is a major breakthrough. What was your team's reaction when you had discovered that you'd been able to shorten the amount of uh, time and blood tests needed to get these results? Well, it is a quest that we've had for a while because I think it is one of the major uh, barriers for really taking circadian science and into what we call circadian medicine, be able to practice. Because if a doctor out there just can't find a easy, practical, and accurate way of determining what is your internal timing, not what's your clock timing outside, then, you know, we can move the field forward. So for us, that that discovery was just extraordinary. We, We basically said, aha, this is great because this is the first step towards providing what I call a biomarker, a time-based biomarker for circadian timing 
And it isn't just for sleep. This really applies to diabetes, hypertension. So what I'm thinking is, how can I tell a cardiologist, for example, and say, maybe your patient's blood pressure is poorly controlled because their circadian rhythms are misaligned or their circadian system isn't functioning well, they're also not getting enough sleep. Well, here, perhaps in the future, we can say you can take a blood test and we can tell you whether the timing, the internal timing is mismatched with the external, social, professional work and or just light-dark cycle uh, environment that the patient may be in. And something that's really interesting is you may be able to help people figure out when to take their medication at the most optimal time because, as you said, timing is everything, especially with medication. Indeed, medications, most medications, the common ones that we use to treat blood pressure and so forth, many of their targets are actually clock genes. This is a more recent discovery, therefore absolutely applicable. So that is what we call chronopharmacotherapy. So chrono is really the clock, the timing uh, issue. It applies to blood pressure medications because, for example, let's say blood pressure, a very common problem, or high, high blood pressure, very common problem, you dip in the, at night. It's nocturnal dipping. It isn't so much what well, your blood pressure is during the day, but the lack of ability to dip during the night is associated with heart disease. And, and it's also associated with better sleep, right? So when you sleep, your nocturnal dips. So would it be that you want actually to take some of your blood pressure medications, depending on the mechanism of the medication, let's say at night, and whereas others you may want to take it during the day. But... All of us are different. Some are owls, some are larks. So we can't just say, hey, take it at 8 p.m. To be more accurate in, in, in this era of personalized medicine, of precision medicine, when we really want to know what your internal timing is so that we can maximize both not just the effectiveness, but also decrease the side effects of medications. How far away are we from having this in every doctor's office in the country? Well, we're a bit far away still. I think this is really the first step, a proof of concept, that we can really do this. What we need to move this time signature test is into patient populations now. This was done in fairly healthy young people. So we need to move that into patient populations, clinical populations, test that. And, and then we can train this algorithm, the sample, better so that it matches and it's applicable to each of these different patient populations. They're going to be very different. Age is going to have an impact on how accurate this will be. So there's still a lot of work in this area, but it's very, very exciting that we have this ability to do that. And I think even more importantly, this paper was about using gene expression data which, of course, is a little harder to, to do in clinical practice. But the beauty of the time signature is that, is that that's why it's called a universal method because it can be applied to any type of omics, metabolites, for example, from the blood, proteins, and metabolites are much easier to get. You can get it from blood very easily. So that's the future of where we're moving forward to is applying this time signature to other types of samples uh, from blood and also in different populations. And tell me, where was this paper published? The paper was published in PANS, which is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So it's, you know, it's, I, I think it, it really speaks to the importance uh, of the of the finding and, and really its implications uh, for the future. And you have an excellent team here at Northwestern across departments who are studying circadian rhythm, and a lot of people contributed to this particular blood test. Tell me about that. Northwestern is quite unique, actually, in the sense I tell people this all the time, that sleep in circadian biology and medicine is high on the list here, and, and it's quite prominently featured. And so there we, we have a Center for Circadian and Sleep Medicine, which uh, really integrates, cuts across departments and perhaps even in also schools within Northwestern University. 
And there are really a large number of people in all departments in Feinberg that are involved uh, in sleep and or circadian research. They are not necessarily sleep doctors. They're really in their own primary uh, departments. For example, a good example is this, um, this, uh, this research is one example where Rosemary Braun, who is the lead author, uh, she is uh, a, in the Department of Preventative Medicine. She is a biostatistician and a physicist. So she is a big, she's a data scientist, which, you know, is just an amazing thing these days. And then we have Ravi Alada, who is in the, in, in, the, in the North Campus or in the Evanston Campus, who is a basic scientist who does work with flies, but also is a physician scientist who has a great interest in looking at these time signatures. So in some ways, it was his idea to come up and say, we can do this. And I said, absolutely, you know what, this is what I need clinically. How can we, as I said earlier, how can we get a blood test that a physician in the future can, can use to identify internal timing? So it is a very highly collaborative um, role. Uh, we also have um, really uh, talented, young, uh, junior faculty in, in the sleep medicine division uh, in Feinberg, like Sabra Abbott, and Kathy Reed, they really did the hands-on work. Imagine collecting blood every half an hour, right, from these individuals across several days and doing all of that. So those are, it's really a great team effort. You spend a lot of time in the clinic seeing patients. When people are at the point where they come to see you in the clinic, what's going on with them and their sleep? Being a, a physician scientist is really one of the, uh, I think, the, one of the differences that I feel that is unique is that we actually do see patients. And I like to think of it this way, that so you can, you, you can look at basic science findings and see how they may contribute to disease. I take my inspiration actually from patients, and I think, why can I not fix this? Why am I limited? And so it goes both ways. Take the basic science knowledge, apply it to the clinic, but also they inspire me to ask the questions. And this is exactly an example of that because I'm frustrated. I can't tell a primary care doc how to tell, how to identify circadian timing because I can do it, but it's too difficult for others to do it. And therefore, that's the inspiration. So it really does help. What do our patients come complaining about? So we have a, the first circadian medicine clinic in the country. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. And when was it, it established? It's a new field. This was established in 2014. Okay, so, so fairly recent. Yeah, fairly recent. And it is a model system. It is a model clinic. Uh, so we also now provide telemedicine for circadian disorders because it, it was thought to be rare. It's not rare. And, and we get patients from all over the country and sometimes all over the world who come to see us, specifically because they've gone everywhere and they don't know what else to do. And now the word is getting out that there is this clinic at Northwestern and, and physicians are referring these patients uh, to us. So they come usually, they can be usually younger adults who have had problems since their teenage years. They can't fall asleep until very late, until 2, 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. They can't wake up in time for school. They can't, you know, as a young adult, they can't get to you know, work uh, on time. And many of them end up getting uh, comorbid um, mental health issues as well, like depression and anxiety disorders. And some of these individuals, not only are they late, but they can't actually keep a entrained rhythm. So every day, their clock drifts later and later and later. So you can imagine it's like they're, they're, they're it's sighted, totally out of control. Totally out of control. And these are individuals who 
Haiku's life are really affected yeah. uh, terribly. Relationships and, and work. At everything, everything. And that is why the quality of life, and that is why they come from all over the country because they're fairly desperate. And, and I think this is something that, for me, it, it's like being a kid in a candy store. When I see these patients and I know I can help them and I give them hope, it's fun. And when I actually see physiology in play, like I said, I think your melatonin rhythm is going to be at 4 a.m. instead of 9 p.m. Let's sample this. Let's take a look at this. And it comes back pretty much like this. And you got it. And I go like, oh, you feel like you just Every day you're discovering something. And then how do you help them? How do you treat them once you discover, you can pinpoint exactly what's happening? So the circadian clock system uh, runs uh, genetically at about 24 hours, but it's not exactly 24 hours. So we need to keep that rhythm in 24 hours. The strongest time giver, or we also call it zygaver for the word time giver, is light. We live in this light-dark cycle. It doesn't matter whether you're a plant or a single-cell organism, you're reflected in this. So light entrains that clock, it shifts the timing of the clock. It accelerates and decelerates the timing of this molecular rhythm. So we can, so let's say somebody's delayed. They come in, I can't fall asleep until three o'clock in the morning, can't wake up. What they need to do, so we need to do is get that clock to run a little faster, right? So we need to advance our timing. We need to get them to sleep earlier and to wake up earlier. So we would give them light in the morning, in the early morning hours of their biological time. A physical light. Physical light. So these could be light boxes. They could be these goggles that we have. And we've all, not we, but the field has discovered that the circadian clock system responds to light, but a special type of light, the short wavelength or blue light is much more powerful. And that I would say you can be visually blind, but not circadian blind. That's how important cool the system is because special uh, receptors in the retina called the retinal ganglion cells, but the receptors are melanosome receptors. They are... they, they, they're more sensitive to short wavelength of blue light, and then they send signals directly from the retina to the hypothalamus to the area of the master clock, which is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So it's really uh, it's, it's, it's something that is so important that from an evolutionary standpoint, it's been conserved. And so light, so we can use timing of light. We can use also melatonin. So melatonin is the opposite of light in some ways. is the brain's and body's dark signal. So you use light. So you're telling the, the individual, this is daytime because their clock thinks it's nighttime. We're, we're, we really are changing the, the expression, the timing of the expression of these genes And we're also then able to align the internal rhythm with that of the work rhythm, the work schedules, as well as the light-dark cycle. So it may be light in the morning, and then at night they take a pill with the melatonin? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Melatonin is a dark signal. Light is a light signal. And then one of more recent findings is the role of both exercise and feeding. So... When you get more light during the day, you also can be more active during the day. And we know that physical exercise can also change the timing of the circadian clock system. It's not as powerful as light. Light is by far the most powerful. Uh, It can also do that. So all of these things are important. And feeding, it isn't how much you sleep only that is important. It's when you sleep. It's not how much you eat that is important is when you eat. And this is, I think, what's happened in the last five years or so that gives us even new ways, innovative ways of treating these patients. We not just do light and melatonin or light. Now we really have to pay attention to when they're exercising, if they're exercising, and then also what they eat, but more importantly, when they eat. Most of these individuals who are let's say delayed sleep phase, they tend to eat very late. 
they eat like, you know, at midnight. They eat at 1 a.m. And what is that telling your clock, your, your metabolic clock system? It's daytime. So all of these begin to play a role. And much of this is, is, is you know, is behavioral types of therapies in, as well as pharmacological. We just don't have a drug right now yet that is pinpoint and say this is a circadian uh, drug other than melatonin and melatonin-like substances. And, and there are, and those are very, very useful. What you're describing are therapies for someone who actually has a circadian rhythm disruption. But for normal, healthy people, someday would they be able to pinpoint their perfect time to exercise or to eat or to sleep to have optimal health? Yes, indeed. We hope that this time signature will be one of those types of tests. It, and as it evolves, I think it could be like a metabolite. Maybe we could even get it from urine and, or saliva. We may not need to uh, get it from blood, although, of course, it's going to be more accurate from blood. So I think moving forward, that is the idea that, you know, this is the first step. We want to be able, because circadian biology, circadian system is so important and integral for health, not just how you feel and not only about sleep, it's about metabolism, it's about cardiovascular function. We've even more, you know, our field has recently discovered that alterations in circadian rhythms is an early risk factor for the development of neurodegeneration and perhaps even Alzheimer's disease. So the implications are for healthy aging, which is for healthy behaviors, but also how we can use these time-based tests to identify early risk factors in patients. Thank you.